appreciate the introduction. I appreciate everyone uh, coming. So, you know, this is some uh, very interesting times that we find ourselves in. And um, uh, we have an incredible amount of social upheaval happening right now. And I think it's just going to intensify rather than detensify. And I think the other thing that's interesting about this time is that the, the social upheaval, the uh, social movements which are going on are happening simultaneously on both the left and the right where usually they happen subsequent to one another, where you have, for example, a civil rights movement that advances black rights, and then a white backlash, which follows that, or cuts it off, or ends it. So there's a short time where the two are happening simultaneously, but here we have an extended period of time which you have uh, left and right actions, left and right movements being built. So that's very uh, um, uh, interesting, uh, particularly because they're happening over a long period of time, and they're happening on the grassroots level. It's not just, even though it includes, the government slamming down on left, um, uh, uh, organizing happening on the left. Uh, so uh, those uh, factors, of course, lead to the potential for substantial social transformation. Also, and that social transformation can happen by huge swings to the left, but also can happen by huge swings to the right. There's no guarantee that it's going to mean a, a, pro, uh, a progressive uh, social transformation. And um, uh, that, for a lot of people, is very unsettling. It can be very scary. Uh, because with things that we have known, whether we like them or not, are familiar, and suddenly those things that are familiar are at risk and we could see them change tremendously. And we don't understand fully what all the implications of those things uh, are going to be. So this is a very exciting moment, but it's also extremely scary. Uh, and so we want to spend a few moments talking about social uh, movements so that we can try to get a better understanding of it. And it, in that way, I think it'll be a little less intimidating, a little less scary, at least for those of us who want to see social transformation happen. For those who want to see social transformation happen, it's probably going to continue to be, do not want to see it happen, rather, it's probably going to continue to be uh, scary and confusing, uh, regardless of the level of understanding. In fact, the level of understanding might make it even scarier uh, than not understanding at all what's going on or being less, less uh, aware of what's going on. So uh, our objective here in this gathering is to develop a, uh, hopefully have to some, some level of common understanding, but certainly develop a deeper understanding of what social movements are, both uh, historically and therefore what they mean, potentially means for today. And hopefully we'll have some time to delve into some of the social movements that are happening right now. Uh, the movement for black lives uh, right now, but also we just recently had Occupy, and I think there's going to be some more uh, coming up as well. So just so we can kind of try to grasp get an understanding of what the potential is for, uh, uh, for this moment. Uh, so I'm going to lay out a few parts, uh, starting out with some definitions and elements of social movements, uh, and then go into the theory of what social transformation uh, uh, could look like or is, uh, and then we'll try to uh, hopefully break each down and have clarifying questions after each section, and then we can go to a free-for-all discussion uh, 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 about the, the bigger ideas and uh, more on the uh, on the debate side rather than the clarifying side, if that's okay. Um, so we're going to examine some of the specifics of the social movement uh, a little more closely also towards the end. So uh, going towards functional definitions of social movements. So what is a social movement? So we talk about it, movements, we're building a movement, we're doing social movement. So uh, I haven't found a, a clear definition that could be like a sentence or two, which is very satisfying, but I think there are a couple of definitions and then a series of elements which we can look at that can help us understand what social movements are and what they have the potential to do. So social movements, I think the key things that we have to have in place is it'll be a loosely connected network of organizations and individuals attempting to advance, reverse, or prevent changes in key laws or social structures. So it'll have to be a, a group of organizations, not just one organization, otherwise it's an organization uh, um, you know, moving its agenda, which is great, but not necessarily movement. It would have to be multiple organizations because they would each be coming at the particular issue from their own perspective. Uh, and then also, they would have to be powerful enough to not only attract those organizations, but to attract individuals who aren't necessarily involved in organizations or who aren't necessarily politically active all the time when, when we're not in a movement area. So made up of multiple organizations. Uh, the momentum of the movement attracts individuals who are not normally politicized. The distinction between a, a, um, a movement and, for example, a mob or a crowd uh, is the uh, idea that it has some direction, that it wants to go in a particular direction, has in mind that it wants to achieve a particular end uh, or win something, as opposed to a mob who just wants to have another drink or whatever it wants to do. Uh, and it's more than rebellions, what people commonly call uh, riots, because, again, it has a, two things. One, it has a particular direction. Uh, both express outrage 
movements often happen on the heels of some uh, event which sparks outrage. So they both uh, express outrage, but the uh, movement has a direction which is going with the outrage beyond just expressing outrage, uh, firstly. Uh, and secondly, is distinguishes itself from a rebellion by it, the na protracted nature of its existence. So a rebellion can last a day, a week, you know, maybe even longer than a week. Uh, a social movement can last for years or decades even in order to advance its objectives or win. Um, uh, so often the, uh, and the reason why of course we talk about now movement and moment, often the movements are sparked, or at least it looks like on the outside they're sparked by a moment by some singular event which brings people together, although rarely does it happen that way. Usually there's a number of things leading up, uh, leading up to it, uh, which aren't always recognized in the same way. We think about this moment being started by Mike Brown's death, uh, but the reality is we can trace it back much longer than that, certainly at least to back to Trayvon Martin. Uh, but of course, it made a substantial jump, a, qual uh, a quantitative, uh, qualitative rather leap uh, uh, at the, uh, when Mike Brown was, uh, was murdered, and there was an urban rebellion in response. So that was a huge leap away from where we were with Trayvon Martin. Uh, but certainly they are all obviously part of the same continuum. Same with Rosa Parks. People think of Rosa Parks as the beginning of the civil rights movement. Many things were happening for the several years before that. And even uh, many analysts have said that the, the roots of the civil rights movement were born in the segregation that existed during uh, the combination of segregation in World War II. Uh, in any event, and then the, uh, the other, I think, identifying uh, marker of a social movement is that it makes its move or, moves or its venue is outside of the normal channels of power. So it's not just getting elected or it's not about getting elected, that there's some way in which it's flexing its uh, influence or flexing its power outside of the normal means of communication, outside of the normal ways of power. Otherwise, if it's going through the normal ways of power, it's not a movement, it is naturally evolving, uh, advancing negotiations which happen inside of the system. And that's different than a social movement which is looking to substantially change the system effectively from the outside. So those are, I think, the other big definition points of uh, social movements. It does have, however, um, uh, several elements and a scope, a uh, potential scope anyway. So social movements, of course, are defined by the objectives that they lay out, the demands that they have, and the means that they use to achieve those demands. But even inside of that, those demands, obviously there's a broad range of what demands can uh, be, and social movements go all inside of that range. So the scope of social movement change then, we think has four different potential scopes. Uh, one is reactionary, and that reactionary is preventing or reversing recent what we call progressive reforms. So these would be conservative uh, uh, social movements. Uh, so it re prevents uh, changes or reverses recent uh, reforms. Uh, or radical changes in values, or even revolutionary shifts in power. Um, uh, so this is a con so, for example, conservative defenses of an existing system would be this kind of social movement. So groundswell of conservative uh, activists, organizers who go and they to oppose some kind of social transformation which is happening uh, from the left or attempting to be happy to move from the left. The second scope would be reformist. And that will be changes in a discrete range of laws or practices. In other words, the system as a whole remains intact, but there's one segment or section of the system, sometimes really thin, sometimes much broader, which is changed because those laws are changed or because, uh, well, mainly because the laws are, or a series of laws or practices are changed. But the system as a whole is left intact, and therefore it's reforming the system, and in many instances makes the system better. Uh, which means if you like the system, that's great. If you don't like the system, then that's bad because it's just improving a system which is bad. Uh, so it's like, you know, if you're chained up somewhere and they bring you a pillow, well, you can appreciate the pillow, but you'd rather not be chained up. Uh, so in those cases, reform may not make uh, people happy or unhappy with the overall system. The third scope, then, would be radical. And those radical would be not just a broader range of the laws and practices. So not, in other words, not just a bigger reform, but it would be a reform of sorts or an overturning of sorts of some of the uh, underlying values uh, which, which make the laws or make the practices happen inside of the system. Uh, so often this produces, as kind of a side effect, a significant number of legal changes. Uh, but the significant number of legal changes happen as a result of value shifts, not as a result, not necessarily as a result of the shifts in laws. So while you can have a reformist movement which shifts the laws, but doesn't necessarily shift the values underneath it. 
And then finally, the fourth scope of social movement change is revolutionary, which overturns the system, changes the values of the systems, changes the laws of the systems, changes practices inside the system, and shifts power from one group inside of that society over to another group inside that. So this is not taking a slice of the system and changing that slice. This is overturning the entire system and replacing it with something all new. So then that would be the scope of things. And then the, um, uh, the extent to which we're able to climb up that scope, if you think of it as a, uh, as a progressive scope, as, as one level being higher than another, rather than thinking all of them the same, they're just different versions of, of the same thing as social movements, would be then the level of ideological po and political unity that those who are engaged in social movement have. So if they have very little political or ideological unity, they're going to seek reforms. If they have a lot, then they're probably going to get radical and change values. If they have a lot more uh, and also have organizational uh, support behind it, then they would they could potentially be revolutionary if that's where they intended to, what they intended to be anyhow. They could have a lot of political unity and a lot of organizational unity, but they don't want to be revolutionary. We want to keep the system intact. All right, so those are that's the scope. And then uh, the final thing in terms of the definition. It are some of the elements associated with social movements. Uh, the elements meaning the things that have to be in place in order to give rise to a social movement. This doesn't mean that even if these elements are in place, that the rise, that the social movement is inevitable. It just means these are some of the things which will have to be in place in order for social movements to happen on any one of the four scopes uh, that we talked about. Uh, and in order to get higher in each of the scopes, uh, you would probably have to add additional elements. But the minimum elements would be some level of system contra contradictions. Uh, that means some kind of tension inside of the system. We'll talk about the contradictions next, uh, so I won't spend too much time on that now. Uh, a clearly identifiable problem. Uh, so something that people can point relatively easily, and again, if you, uh, the more complex it is, the further you have to go along with ideological political unity, but a clearly identif identifiable problem. So the problem could be segregation, the segregation laws, and the movement could be built to end the segregation laws. Uh, the problem could be um, police brutality, and then a movement is launched to end police brutality. There's all kinds of things that it could be. Uh, but there's, a, there's another layer beneath that, uh, which again we'll go into uh, 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 in, a, in a little bit. Um, uh, then uh, in addition to the identifiable problem, which exists quite some time, like police brutality in the black community is not anything new. This is a, a problem which has been identified uh, over a large number of years, over decades, uh, possibly even centuries, depending on how you define uh, police. And um, so it's not a new problem. But it also then takes, on top of the problem, a spark uh, uh, or some, some individual uh, action which creates this moment. And that, of course, action or spark has to happen inside of the context of the uh, area where there's a clearly identifiable, uh, identifiable problem. So that spark or trigger or what we would what we'll call later on uh, in the next section uh, a, a dialectic uh, would then create this moment and then if they can get a couple of other things together then that would create a movement out of that moment so just because you have the, all those three previous areas uh, that could set the state set the table for a social movement but it wouldn't necessarily result in a social movement. Um, so a example of some sparks or some triggers as we mentioned already would be uh, Rosa Parks, the foreclosure crisis, uh, where people suddenly were losing their homes and they didn't know what they were going to do and they became homeless. And in the meantime, they're using the spare money to bail out the banks. Uh, Occupy Wall Street, where there's a physical takeover, a place that inspired many people to engage in, in, a, in a social movement. Uh, uh, Mike Brown's murder. So all kinds of things can lead to that. Um, uh, but so, again, just those things alone don't make for a social movement. You have to have at least the next couple of, um, of elements. Uh, one is a demand, at least one demand. What does the social movement want or expect out of the system? If you have all these other things in place and you have general outrage, anger at the, move, at the uh, system, and even anger over a particular problem that exists inside the system, but the people, group of people who have this problem or who are expressing this level of anger are unable to put that in the form of a demand, then you cannot have a viable social movement. There's nothing holding the social movement together. Uh, uh, so the demand has to, be, uh, has to be present in order for there to be a social movement. The demand, uh, we want to make a, a distinction here uh, <coughs> between demands and objectives. So uh, a demand can be an ob uh, uh, the same as an objective. They can align with one another, but they don't necessarily have to do so. Uh, and so an objective is usually much broader than a demand, but a demand is a way of achieving the objective. 
So in social movements that we've seen in the United States, certainly recently, we have had demands, but we haven't necessarily had, we have similar demands, and uh, demands that have united and brought together a social movement, but have not necessarily had similar objectives. So during the civil rights movement, for example, the demand was pretty clear, and segregation laws. That was the demand. That was what, what people who were involved in the movement wanted to get out of the, uh, out of the government at that time. Uh, that does not mean that the objectives that were associated with the demand were necessarily the same. There was no unity around, and therefore no social movement around the objectives. In other words, some people wanted to end the laws of segregation because they wanted to be in an interracial relationship, and it was against the law. So that was the goal that they wanted. Their objective was to get married to someone outside of the race. The only way they could achieve that was to advance the demand of the end of segregation, and that's how they were able to do that. Uh, others wanted to build a movement, like the Black Panther Party, for example, wanted to build a movement to overthrow the United States government. And they couldn't do that given the uh, social constructs that had to exist and the political uh, police constructs that had to exist around black communities uh, as a way of enforcing segregation. So they wanted to end segregation, not because they wanted to marry white people, but because they thought that would create enough political space that would allow them to launch attacks on the U.S. government. So those objectives, even though they shared the demand, the objectives were so wildly different, they could be together in a social movement around demands, but they could not be together in a social movement around broader objectives. So they could achieve a reform level of scope, but they could never achieve together, anyhow, a radical level of scope or even a revolutionary level of scope. The Black Panther Party could potentially do that by themselves, but certainly not the broad group of people who were involved in trying to end uh, racial segregation as a legal system. Uh, so demands. Uh, uh, next is organization. Not everyone who joins a movement has to be in an organization. Obviously, that helps. And I think organization is a critical part of uh, advancing uh, social justice and uh, social transformation. But there are movements. Movements exist where people join as individuals, not necessarily as organizations. Uh, but you have to have some level of organization in order to move. Some organizations play a more significant role than others. And you have to have that in order to, uh, uh, to move a, a movement. If there's no organizations, the movement would not be able to sustain. It'll be a rebellion. Uh, but it won't be a um, uh, it won't be a, a, a long-lasting or protracted struggle, which which defines a social movement. And the final element that has to be there is some level of hope. And this is the one that's really difficult to define. But without some level of hope, people would not be able to engage in a protracted struggle. Even if they engage in a short-term struggle, it really isn't a real way of uh, what. Um, uh, uh, Huey Newton called revolutionary suicide, which is a desire to, even in the short term, such a strong desire to live like a human being that they're willing to engage in activities that would, they know are going to result in their death. Uh, so there could be that, but that wouldn't be good enough to, to uh, engage in a protracted uh, struggle. Uh, and again, outrage could result in urban rebellion, but doing, sacrificing day after day uh, over the long, course, uh, long period of time well, could only happen with hope. There's the uh, the Montgomery bus boycott uh, would not have been successful if people did not think one year people walked and for miles in each direction and paid all kinds of uh, tickets that they got because they were doing uh, ride shares and sacrifice. The only way they were going to be able to do that is if they somehow believed that at the end of the process they were going to get something. Uh, and that something that they got would be much greater than what they had now. So without that, there's no way that could have happened over that long period of time. It could have been a rebellion, but it could not have been... Um, uh, the uh, protracted uh, Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, so that's it for the for the elements. A couple of quick notes about um, this, just to clarify uh, a few things. Again, that it's it is not necessary for movements to share underlying analysis or objectives. They do have to share demands, however. But when they just share demands and not objectives or not underlying analysis it means that they're going to be limited in terms of what they can accomplish in terms of the scope, and that means they can only be reformists at that point, even if they vie to be more than that. They're not going to be able to be that just because of the, the limits that are, are, exist around not having shared analysis, objectives, or visions. Um, so, good, so having those things would lead them to a broader, uh, a broader scope. The objectives, not just the demands, but the objectives reveal the potential scope of the social movement. So if you have a social movement, uh, and they have, even if they do have clear demands, if they don't have clear objectives uh, that are much bigger than the demands, where are they going after those demands are one, then it's going to limit the scope uh, uh, of where they can go. Um, uh, again, protracted struggle distinguishes it from rebellion. 
Uh, I also want to make a make a, a, a just a transition about the or or a clarification about the way that it, that the importance of um, operating outside of the existing means of power or means of communication. Uh, labor movements, in other words, social movements designed to win rights for labor as uh, in general, uh, would qualify as social movements because it, it impacts a broad number of people, broad number of get involved in a large number of organizations. However, once labor movements win and become unions, then those unions, generally speaking, do not uh, qualify as uh, participants in a social movement because they are narrowly worried, concerned about wages or whatever, or con specific conditions inside of a specific job rather than society-wide, and it's difficult, therefore, to get support from outside. Uh, a number of labor uh, unions could band together and build a movement that way, but labor unions individually seem to be outside of that. So that also uh, reveals some of the potential pitfalls of, uh, or dangers of movements is when they win something, they have the potential to completely die off uh, uh, after that very, very quickly. Uh, and the final notes about, uh, uh, about uh, social movements is that they have a, another defining point is that they have a life cycle. And this makes social movements then different from organizations in that social movements have a uh, often identifiable life cycle. Sometimes it's not so ident identifiable, but they would have a clear beginning and a clear end, or not so clear beginning, not so clear end, but would have a, clear begin uh, would have a beginning and end. Um, uh, certainly there's a publicly identifiable part against, for example, starting with Rosa Parks and roughly ending with the uh, passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act uh, would be then uh, the beginning and end of the civil rights movement, even though there's some movement before that and there's movement after that. Social movements then could end in one of several ways, uh, seize power and basically become the system, so that ends the social movement, if the social movement upstart trying to change society, and it has changed the society, and it has then taken control of the society, then it no longer exists as a social movement. Uh, it can make social change, whether it's radical or whether it's reformist, and get legitimized by the system. So the system legitimizes them, which means that they have then a formal means of, of, uh, of uh, addressing grievances, which means they're no longer a social movement. The best example of this is Martin Luther King and the civil rights, in particular, but the civil rights movement in general. Uh, the other way is to make changes, win concessions, win reforms, uh, and then get marginalized by the system. So instead of getting legitimized by the system, marginalized by the system. The best example of this uh, is the uh, communist and socialist uh, parties in the labor movement uh, who push for um, uh, 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 labor reforms, which were wide, widely panned at the time, which was, for example, 40-hour work week and minimum wage and end child labor. But once those things were won, instead of saying, this is great, everyone should become a member of the Communist Party and the Socialist Party, the Communist Party and the Socialist were again marginalized from the mainstream. And the system, the ironic thing here is that in those cases, the system then takes credit for the victories, for its, its loss. So the system goes, it fights against these changes, it loses the fight, and then it says, we're a great country because we allow this, that, and the other thing now. We've ended child labor. Um, the social movement can lose and retool for later. Best example of this is uh, our conservatives who engage in engaged in you can leave it, well, you know, uh, uh, conservatives who engage in um, anti-integration actions in the 1950s and 60s, uh, in the mid to late 70s. Once it was clear they had no leg to stand on in that respect, they then retooled. They didn't disappear. They didn't recoil. Then then retooled, and now they fight for culture war uh, uh, issues such as gay marriage and. Um, uh, and abortion, things like that. So losing and retooling, losing and dissolving, and getting crushed. Black Panther Party is a good example of a move, social movement that was crushed by the, uh, uh, by the government and therefore disappeared. Uh, so crushed there in that case meant murder. All right, so those are some of the uh, working definitions of, um, uh, of social movements. I want to get now into the theory of social transformation. Um, so how social transformation actually, how societies change, how societies mer uh, morph from one or evolve from one way of being into a, another way of being. So social, this, the underlying idea here, at least the way that, that, uh, uh, that we see it, uh, is that the underlying idea here is that social constructs and even naturally occurring constructs uh, feature built-in tensions. In other words, however they're designed, they have built-in tensions or built-in conflicts of interest. Uh, so some, and some of those tensions rise to high levels, and we'll call some of those tensions, we'll call, we'll call them contradictions. So contradictions would be conflicts of interest, where two, different, two or more different parties have inherent conflicts of interest inside even a team 
or an entity which is going in the same direction, uh, generally speaking. Um, uh, so for example, inside of an organization, if we're all part of an organization, and a few people in the organization were, for example, the executive board, and everyone else were members, the two groups, members of the executive board and members of the organization, would, might have different interests inside of the organization, even if the organization would go in the same direction. So the executive board, for example, might want the operations of the organization to run very efficiently, very quickly, and very smoothly, and would have an interest in putting in rules, putting in things that make those things happen, uh, putting in systems that make those things happen, that make the organization run smoothly, quickly, and efficiently. The members of the organization, however, might have different interests, directly confl conflicting with that of the executive board, which is to have their voice heard throughout the process. And having their voice heard throughout the process, particularly given the fact that the voices are going to be uh, many and varied, uh, that means that the system is no longer efficient and no longer quick. So these are natural tensions that are built inside of an organization anytime you have one uh, uh, people who occupy different positions inside of there. So that creates that a, a conflict. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but that does exist in, uh, in social formations. In schools, students want a good education, teachers want good working conditions, and those sometimes conflict with one another. In a society, uh, one person has the right to free speech, another person uh, has the right to peace and quiet. So those two things are rights that both have, and yet those rights in some ways conflict with one another, or certainly can, uh, on Saturday night. And so the extent to which they conflict with one another then creates some kind of tension or some kind of contradiction, which at some point has to be resolved. And so the society has to figure out, or the organization or the school has to figure out, then how do we resolve it when two people have a legitimate point of view uh, and, uh, and they're fighting it out. So every system then, has, every entity, every society has contradictions and conflicts. And as the contradictions work themselves out over time, they often result in uh, multiple uh, the multiple sets of interests, the multiple groups that have different interests, in evolving into positions that are mutually antagonistic. Uh, or we just have somehow devolve into crisis, as e uh, economies, capitalist economies certainly uh, often do. And the crisis then has to be resolved, or the entire system is going to explode. So then how the society or the entity has to figure out how to resolve those crises. So in response, when there's a crisis, either because we have these, these uh, interests which are uh, uh, mutually uh, uh, contradictory, or because there's a general crisis uh, which doesn't necessarily have to do, although we think that it often do, has to do with, uh, with what the interests are of one group over another. Uh, the two or, there are two or more competing ideas about how to solve the crisis. And these two or more competing ideas then fight it out. The one interest group argues for one, another interest group argues for another, and they do what they do from their perspective. Uh, they argue from their perspective to win whatever it is that they can win. Uh, people over to their position in order to advance their goal. The, this is what we would call a social clash. And that is a clash or a conflict between classes or interest groups inside of an entity, inside of a society, who fight out for, uh, to fight to win the argument over how the entity should be reorganized in light of the crisis. So what does that look like? So society might find itself in a crisis because as a direct result of skyrocketing healthcare costs, you have people who are losing their homes, uh, people who are losing their life savings, uh, people who are, uh, uh, you know, did pretty well in life and saved money throughout their life and then now are living uh, in poverty because they are unable to pay medical bills that are rising. So this rises then to a level of crisis. So the society then has to figure out how do we manage this crisis, how do we deal with this crisis, how do we solve this crisis. Then different uh, groups inside of the society emerge and they say, this is an idea that I have about how we can solve the society. And one group says, leave it to the market. The market can fix this, just give it to the market, and the market will take care of it. Another group says, we should have a government-run insurance pool. And another group says, we should have a uh, insurance pool that is managed by government, but not run by government. Another group would say that we should have universal health care for every single person, regardless of their uh, status, regardless of their ability to pay. So that these different ideas then fight it out, sometimes fairly, most of the time not fairly, and then as a result of this clash, of this fighting out of these different ideas, the existing way of doing things is overturned and replaced with something else. And that is essentially what makes up the, uh, uh, the social clash. So uh, at the end of the day then, the society, or at least one segment of the society, is completely overturned and replaced with something entirely different and entirely new. So the process then for social transformation is first you have the system four parts to it. 
You have a system that has natural contradictions. Every system is going to have natural contradictions. The second one is that a crisis, which is rooted in a subset of those contradictions. So you have a crisis that happens in the society as a result of a subset of the contradictions, at least we think so. There could be some that are not as a result of the contradictions. You just have a crisis, an earthquake comes, something like that. So how do you resolve the crisis? The third is that there's a social clash around the ideas on how to resolve the crisis. So the crisis happens, and then you have these different ideas about how to solve the crisis, and the social clash ensues on, uh, uh, on how to resolve the crisis. And then the fourth is the emergence from the clash of a new way, the destruction of the old way of doing things and the emergence of a new way of doing things as a direct result of the, of the social clash. So those would be then the four, uh, uh, the four parts then to social transformation. And those things happen over and over and over in organizations, in societies, uh, happens over and over again. And those are the things that propel or move history, are those four elements coming in one by one uh, in sequence uh, as a way of, of changing both small parts of society and large parts of society. Um, and the way in which we'll go, we'll go over this a bit, the way in which it happens uh, that, the, that a particular group or class, particularly the working class or black people, uh, work, black working class in the United States or, or in virtually another society, then wins uh, in these social clashes is through social movements. That's the way that we then engage in those, those social clashes in order to change things. So we think that in the US, uh, we have had three, thus far, three major social clashes, which has fundamentally transformed the society. So the first one is what we commonly call the Civil War. There was a crisis because there were uh, two conf conflicting um, uh, forces in the society, which came into, again, mutually unresolvable conflict. Uh, and that was a burgeoning industrial revolution in a society that had the predominant means of economic development being rooted in slavery, in free labor and free unskilled labor. The Industrial Revolution, of course, could not uh, accommodate large numbers of unskilled laborers, had to have some level of skill associated with it. Uh, and therefore, uh, there was a crisis there because there were, you can't have two economies, slave economy and industrial economy, that coexist inside of the same country. Those would have to be two separate countries. Uh, so, uh, as a result of that crisis, this really took on the big ultimate in social clash. It became an actual civil war. And as a result of the civil war, uh, a new uh, reality emerged. And that was the Industrial Revolution, the end of slavery, Reconstruction, and the society was fundamentally changed forever. So as a direct result of the social class that happened because of the, industrial, the emerging Industrial Revolution, this society underwent a huge social transformation, social clash, and then social transformation. The second major social clash in the United States is what's commonly called the Great Depression. Uh, the Great Depression, there was a crisis, which is an economic meltdown rooted in the interests of the money class, but the impact, even though it was also felt by the money class, was really felt by the working class there. The clash was they had one idea that uh, uh, laissez-faire capitalism uh, would solve this problem. In other words, let the market work it out. Uh, and the other side was, was of the clash was that labor uh, workers should have some protections around them. There should be some protections around their uh, labor. There should be some protections around their savings when they put the money in the bank. And there should be some protections around their ability to retire. Uh, and, that, uh, and that was the clash that, uh, that, that engaged those two different ways of looking at the problem of the uh, Great Depression and what the potential solution would be. And as a result, you had an entirely new society that emerged out of that clash. You had the New Deal. You had a social safety net, which was built. Um, you had labor laws, uh, which were created. And you had uh, the severest restrictions on capital that happened in a very short period of time uh, 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 in order to prevent, prevent or try to prevent these things from this kind of a, a crash from happening again. So that was the second major social clash. The third major social clash was the civil rights movement. The crisis was that you had a black middle class who had the ability to, financial ability, to do all kinds of things, such as go to nice restaurants and go on vacation in places and buy good clothes, but then didn't have the social mobility to do those things. So they could, they could go to a nice restaurant because they could afford it, but they weren't allowed in because of, uh, of race, because of social class. Uh, so um, uh, as a result, there was, a, and, and because people were not willing to put up with that, and of course the, for the working class and lower uh, economic classes, there was the constant 
physical and emotional and social mistreatment that they were undergoing, and because a critical mass of people were no longer willing to put up with that behavior, engage in um, sit-ins and, um, uh, and all kinds of other direct action in order to prevent the economic system in the United States from running as normal. And uh, so this clash was between segregation as a legal system or legal non-intervention. Certainly it was not integration was, was the solution, but the removal of segregation laws um, so that there was, uh, uh, so there are no more segregation laws. And as a result, the new society emerged where it was the end of segregation. There was an expansion of access uh, in certain ways, uh, uh, access based on skin color, but no expansion of access to financial, um, uh, uh, to most financial uh, aspects of society, uh, to a significant segment of uh, society. Um, uh, but there were also restrictions because of all kinds of other issues which were at play as well. Restrictions on military usage because of the war against Vietnam, an expansion of women's rights because of the women's rights movements at the time, uh, etc. So those are the three major social clashes that happened. The way this process that we talk about where you have the crisis and then as a result of the crisis you have the clash and then as a result of the clash you have this new uh, uh, aspect or element of society which emerges is called the dialectical process. You hear it often talk, talked about as historical materialism or dialectical materialism. And these are concepts you have to know in order to, of course, understand Marx, but also to understand, uh, we think have a scientific understanding of the way history moves, whether or not you agree with Marx. Uh, but dialectical, dialectical materialism and historical materialism are both ways of understanding the way, the, the, the way social clashes happen, uh, interpreting them, but also predicting them. Uh, because of, of the elements that exist inside of a society or exist inside of an organization or anywhere else. So we assert that dialectics, the dialectical process, is the only real way to understand the movement of history and the only real way to understand the relationship of one social force towards another. And therefore, the only way we can understand this point in history in which we find ourselves with this tremendous social upheaval and with what this uh, potential for a social movement might mean the only way to understand that is by understanding the process of <coughs> dialectical and historical materialism. But particularly important, even inside of that, the only way to understand how we get from here, which is where we are, we have black people getting killed every day, and you have uh, uh, black teenagers getting beat up by police in class in front of teachers who stand there and do nothing, to getting to something else. The only way to know how to get from where we are now to where we want to be is by understanding this process and our role in it. That's the only way we can advance there. Um, so uh, the big question in, in a certain way inside of this context is how do oppressed people, the people who are not power, the people who don't have money, uh, how do they advance their own interests in the context of a social clash, in the context of a crisis in the, uh, when we're at the cusp of a social movement? All right, so I want to stop here for just uh, uh, on the dialectical process and see if there's any clarifying questions on dialectics or the definitions about um, uh, social clashes and what they are. And then we'll continue with the next part of it. After that. No clarifying questions? Direct challenges? All right. Okay, so. Um, so we're arguing that then, that inside a dialectical process, we know there's going to be uh, uh, that we're right now inside of what we would call a crisis, uh, which is the way uh, black people uh, are treated in the society. We have a particular interpretation of that, which we'll get into uh, a bit later. Uh, but we think that there's a particular, uh, that we have a crisis then, and that we have the potential to uh, advance this to the level of social clash. And necessarily out of the social class, there has to come then something on the other side, which is entirely different than what we have now. Uh, and it could be really, really different. It could be moderately different. It could be different, but not as different as we want, uh, or different in a direction that we don't particularly want. So the real question is then, how do we get there? So um, this is part of a, uh, we're going to go down to some of the problem. This is part of a larger presentation, so some of the parts here we're not going over. Um, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, oppression. So oppression and exploitation. So we have. Uh, throughout history, individuals, um, uh, corporations, governments who have engaged in brutal acts of oppression and exploitation. Uh, and that will be slavery, that will be robbing people of their wages, that will be horrible, horrible working conditions, that will be uh, oppressing uh, people, preventing them from realizing their, um, uh, their potential. 
uh, and uh, oftentimes what has happened at the end, if you look at it over a long enough period of time, you've had rebellions against the people who are doing the oppressing. You had them, uh, those who were oppressed murdering those who were oppressing them, uh, certainly rising up and attempting to murder them, so all kinds of crazy things. So why would one human being engage in oppression and exploitation? Why oppress someone else? Why exploit someone else? What's the benefit for it? Why are you doing that? Uh, particularly given the dangerous nature of it, that you know at some point you're going to end up you know, in the crosshairs. Why do uh, individuals, uh, institutions, and governments engage in oppression, uh, oppressive and exploitative behavior? Anyone? Take a guess. There's social paths. There's social paths. Social? Sociopaths. 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 <laughs> Yes, that's possible. <laughs> Some cases. Well, there's enormous amounts of surplus value, to use a Marxian term, to be to be made out of doing how to do it. Super Enor exploit. Enormous amount of surplus value right. can be realized from. Some sort of religious belief. A little louder. Some sort of religious belief. Some sort of religious belief. That one of the big tensions, big big debates, is whether it's religious belief or whether it's a uh, realization of, of uh, surplus value. Yeah. To assert and perpetuate power. To get power. Yeah. Anything else? So we'd argue that there's two fundamental reasons why uh, uh, there has been such a long and deep and sordid history of oppression and exploitation. And that's either profit or privilege. The reason you engage in exploitation is to make a profit. So if I wanted to make a million dollars, the most difficult way for me to do it would be for me to try to produce one million dollars worth of wealth, or to try to produce one million dollars worth of value and then get mm -hmm. that myself. The easiest way for me to do it is to send all of you out to work and get each of you to make a few thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, and then for me to steal your tens of thousands of dollars. That would actually be the easiest way to, easiest way in some ways, uh, uh, to um, to get a million dollars. And in that way, I would be exploiting you for the purpose of making profit. Uh, because of course, I would exploit you because that would not be fair to you if, if you would go out and you would work for it and then I would end up taking all the money or the vast majority of the money. So the reason people engage in exploitation is for profit. The reason people engage in oppression is for another type of profit, which is privilege. So why do white people in Appalachia, in, who are dirt poor, uh, who don't have running water inside of their house, why are they engaged in such uh, racially prejudice, uh, prejudicial um, uh, behavior, uh, certainly thoughts and ideas? It's not because they're profiting from it. They're not getting wealthy off of it, which you can argue like the Koch brothers are doing or you know, other wealthy capitalists are doing. But they're not doing that, and James Baldwin has uh, one of the best lines about that, he had spent some time in, in Appalachia visiting with people there and wrote an essay around it and he said that there is an entire group of people in this country whose miserable existence is made bearable merely because they are not black. Like that's their whole life. Why do men engage in the oppression uh, of women? Because we derive some kind of privilege from it. We get access to jobs, we get uh, spaces that women don't get access to, whites get access to jobs and spaces that we don't get. And when they don't, even when they don't have access to jobs, they get some kind of psychological privilege or benefit from thinking that they are, at least there's someone in this world who they are better than, regardless of what their particular lot is. Right? So the reason people engage in uh, oppression and exploitation is to advance their quest for either profit or, or privilege. This is critical to understanding um, uh, both how some social structures work, but also then how to get out of them. So this is the way that uh, uh, oppression and exploitation, this is why oppression and exploitation work. And of course, again, this is the, the uh, economic versus social argument. So those who are making the economic argument would say that the religious reasons uh, for oppressing one religion group and oppressing another uh, is merely cover or a way that those who are making the most money from it are just convincing those below them uh, to, to do that, but just a cover to engage in that behavior, but it's just a cover in order to uh, advance the idea of profit. 
uh, an immense idea of exploitation because it would be very difficult to convince large numbers of people to exploit other human beings, to participate in the exploitation of other human beings, particularly when they're not deriving all kinds of benefit from it. So the way they would derive all kinds of benefit from it, of course, is then for an economic system to dominate a religious system and then say that the economic reality is a God-ordained, uh, or uh, 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 de deity-ordained reality. And that the, uh, uh, so in India, uh, the caste system is seen as something handed down by, uh, by God or the gods. Uh, that people are, the people who are scooping up feces in the street with uh, napkins, this is their job uh, that God gave them. This is what they're doing in order to advance their so that's what they would say, of course, those who are looking at the economic point of view are saying, this is the way that those who have money to prevent those who don't have money from rising, again, rising up against them. Because they are convincing those people that rising up against them is actually rising up against God. So that would be the argument the, the other way. Um, uh, so if this is the reason why people engage in, uh, uh, in oppression and exploitation, oops, then question is, how do we end oppression and exploitation? It's shockingly simple. So people engage in oppression and exploitation to make profit or privilege. How do we end oppression or exploitation? We stop the systemic benefits of privilege, especially the psychological create stops for the seven benefits of privilege? Mm -hmm. And the, the privilege world, not the profit world. How do we end profit, uh, exploitation for the purpose of profit? So we just end, end profit, make it not profitable. The way we end uh, oppression and exploitation that's based on profit and privilege is to make the system too costly to maintain. So the moment that the cost of the system of oppression and exploitation is greater than the benefit of the system of oppression and exploitation, then there's no point in engaging it. So if uh, I'm engaged in oppressive and exploitative behavior and I hire security guards and goons to uh, keep all of you in check so I can continue to take your money as you produce uh, well. And I'm spending $50,000 on security guards, and they're making, and you guys do your work that's being enforced by the security guards, uh, and making me $100,000 every month, then I'm going to continue to do that. It makes total and complete sense because I'm doing it for the money. But the minute you do something that uh, costs me more than $100,000, so I spend $50,000 and you kill the guards, and then you steal all of my money, so it cost me $150,000, and so I spent $50,000, and then I lost $150,000, or lost another $100,000, so I lost $150,000 in all by spending $50,000, then it's too costly. Then even if I had religious hatred for you, or even if I had social hatred for you, at some point it just wouldn't be worth it. At some point, I'd be like, okay, as much as I hate these people, either for religious reasons or for racial reasons or for gender reasons, it's just not worth it right now. I'm losing too much money. Because they're not actually doing it for fun. And this is, I think, some place, ways in which we, uh, uh, on the left, uh, limit or harm ourselves in terms of analysis when we say that the reason why, um, uh, for example, big businesses uh, pollute the earth is because they hate nature or they hate uh, small animals. They're not like... Uh, the, the loggers, the logging companies who go in and log the woods and they endanger uh, owls or other, uh, uh, other animals, they don't hate the owls so bad that if they're driving down the road and they see an owl over there, they make a U-turn and go up the next exit, turn around and come back just to try to run over the owl. They don't hate the owl with that kind of passion, but they are willing to, they're not going to let some owl stand in the way of them making money. But if it costs them more money to, uh, uh, to extract the, the wealth from the earth than it did, that they got in return, then they would no longer engage that behavior. Not because they felt indifferent about the owl or because they felt indifferent about uh, the resource of the earth, but because they weren't making any money off it. So then the, the job of the social movement then is to make it more costly to, in, to continue the, the system of exploitation and oppression than it is to, uh, that the benefits uh, make it worth. 
So then, in a, in a more narrow sense, in terms of uh, uh, building social movements, if you have a social movement that's built fundamentally on civil disobedience and what we call positive action, then the campaign has to be, the objective of the campaign has to be to make us unmanageable. And that unmanageability increases the cost, decreases the benefits, and in the end, the system becomes too costly to maintain. And once the system is too costly to maintain, then there's no purpose in continuing. Right? So then the social movement then, the potential for the social movement then, is to go to the system, or at least a portion of the system, and by making that, changing the cost-benefit analysis of the system, then we could change that whole sector or segment of society. But that is the only way to do it. So the, the reason um, uh, systems of injustice have been able to, to maintain over such a long period of time is because they've been profitable. But the moment they become unprofitable, then they revert to something else. They shift to something else that is more profitable. And the power of the social movement is the ability to make it, make the system as it exists too costly to maintain. And that's where we have to go. So then what would that look like? All right, so here we have discrimination in public accommodations. This is a system of both exploitation and oppression. And in the system of discrimination against uh, public accommodations, the rewards for these, like why do people engage in this? What were the rewards for it? The rewards for uh, segregation laws and discrimination uh, were reduced spe public spending on the black community and a white race privilege and pride. So as a result of uh, segregation laws, which allowed for separate and unequal, you had uh, white schools which were better than black schools. So if you had a town that had two schools, one was white, one was black, it didn't have to spend the same amount of money on each. It didn't have to spend $100,000 or whatever the amount would be on each school. It could spend uh, uh, 150 on the white school and 50 on the black school. So there was a, uh, or it could even spend uh, 150 on the, um, uh, on the white school and 40 on the black school and then take the other 10 and the elected officials could steal it or they can use it to fill up gaps other places in the, uh, in the budget. So there was a direct benefit for the public sector in that. The, the public sector certainly as a government, as, a, uh, uh, as an entity. And there was all kinds of benefits for individual whites. In addition to the racial pride one, which allowed them to say we're better and we get better things because we're white, uh, they also got better schools. And in, that, in this analysis, who in their right mind would say, I want to, I want to take money from my child's school? Like people are now fighting to have more money put in their children's school. Who would, at that time or any other time, say, I want less money put in my son's school or my daughter's school? No one would say that. Um, uh, that, and, and it was there, very, therefore very hard, even if you didn't uh, agree with uh, the, uh, the, the idea, the notion that blacks were inherently uh, unequal to, to, to whites, it was still difficult to then say, I want to take money out of my child's school, because that became the norm. Right? In public accommodations, white people got the new state-of-the-art 1949 water fountain, uh, and they were able to have that because they were not required to provide the same for black people. On the buses, this is like the bus ride of everyone's dreams. You get your own seat uh, during rush hour. You don't have to share it with anyone. And the seats are not very worn. They're brand new seats all the time because no one's ever sitting on them. This is like, this is why people ride public transportation. This is in the back, I don't know if you can see it, but there are people standing and double and tripled up in the uh, doorway there. Every seat is taken and, and several people are standing. This is why people don't want to take public transportation. So everyone here is paying the same amount of money. There's more black people than there are white people. And yet all the black people are stuffed and all the white people are, uh, are seated in their own individual chairs and don't have to share with anyone. And there's even an empty seat right here. Um, uh, but of course, the laws at the time was that uh, black could not sit on the same level, uh, on the same side as white, so they had to sit always behind. So if, if he wasn't there, someone could sit here. But as soon as he sits there, then we could only start sitting behind so who would give up voluntarily, say, my bus rides are not packed enough. I want to have a full jam-packed bus ride. Uh, uh, this is like a great bus ride for them. And even though it's not so hot for, uh, for black people, uh, there is a definite privilege here to, um, uh, to this uh, discrimination. right? So then how do we end this? How do we convince the majority of the population that you should put less money in your children's schools and that you should have a less comfortable ride on the way to and from work? 
How do we convince people of that, given the fact that they're getting this now? There's all kinds of benefits to this injustice. How do we convince people to give up that benefit? Here's discrimination in the private sector, another form of oppression and exploitation, only serving uh, whites um, and only hiring uh, whites. So there were all kinds of economic rewards here. Um, there were, for restaurants, for example, there were more profits uh, in the restaurant business because a good chunk of the customers you didn't have to serve inside of the restaurant. So if you had a restaurant and you had the same number of black customers as you had whites, the white ones you had to seat inside, you had to get them real plates, you had to have a waiter or waitress for them. So if you had 100 people, you had to have like five or six waiters or waitresses who were working the tables. But the black customers, if you had 100 of them, none of them were allowed to eat inside. They got their plates in the back with a styrofoam container. You could have just one person taking it out to them. Uh, so you had one waiter or waitress for 100 black people and four or five waiter or waitresses for the uh, white customers. And the, um, uh, and the white customers, in addition, had indoor seating, maybe air conditioning, whatever it is that they had. There were all kinds of uh, financial rewards from having to significantly reduce your output per customer for your black customers. Uh, in addition, there was less business kept competition for whites and more jobs for whites. So again, who would say, you know, what business would say, I want to have greater costs associated with my uh, customer acquisition or, or maintaining uh, or serving customers? And who would say, I want more competition for the jobs that are out there? No one in their right mind would say that. And so all these privileges that exist then, it's very difficult to ask people to give them up because there's a direct profit or privilege benefit to them. So how do we then get, the, again, the majority of the population to say, we are voluntarily, well, voluntarily is quote unquote, uh, going to give up the, prop, the, the profit or the privilege that we have here. All right, so what's happening in these pictures? The lunch counter sit-ins. Right? Lunch counter sit-in over here. What about here? The Montgomery bus boycott. The Montgomery bus boycott, right. So in the Montgomery bus boycott, you see you have an empty bus in the back there and a carpool happening right here, where people are getting into, uh, something into a car while the bus goes around. And here you have an empty bus driving around town. So during the time of the Montgomery bus boycott, you had buses which the day before were completely jam-packed as we saw from the previous picture. Uh, and while they were jam-packed, they were of course collecting money from everyone. Now they are still riding that up and down the same streets. They're still paying the driver. They're still using gas. They're still wearing the tires. They're still uh, uh, deteriorating the engine. And they have to get fixed and repairs on them on a regular basis but there's no money coming in to them during this time, right? So there's no, certainly no city financial benefit for this right now. Uh, the white customers may love it because they get even more seats available to them, but they know that this isn't gonna last because they're paying, you know, five people paying to, for a fare for a full bus, they know it's not gonna last all that long uh, anyhow, right? Here in the uh, lunch counter city, <coughs> you have a business that's open, they have a waitress over here, and then they got other staff out here, uh, they have meat in the refrigerator, they have cooks in the back, they have the lights on, they have supplies that they bought, and they can't serve any food. So they're paying a full staff, they have a, all kinds of food that is going rotten, and they can't serve any food because black people are sitting in. And not only do they not want to serve the black people, but according to the law, they, they are not allowed to serve black people. So if they start serving the black people, they would get arrested for breaking the, you know, both of them would get arrested, the black person sitting there and the uh, the, the waiter or waitress who serves them, right? Because it's against the law to do that. So this is costing the business all kinds of money. This is costing the, uh, at the time, a private bus company, but also the city, all kinds of money because they had some kind of agreement about uh, how much they could, uh, uh, they had minimums that, they, uh, that the city promised them to make. So by engaging in this kind of, uh, of action, uh, it actually was making the individual restaurants bankrupt and it was wreaking havoc on the bus company as well as the uh, city budget, uh, which was now running full bus service with something like 10% of its normal uh, bus ridership. Right? So complete and total economic devastation, at least in this narrow, uh, narrow area. So what that did then is created what we call a decision dilemma. And again, this is part of another uh, uh, presentation. But the, it creates a decision dilemma where the first decision is, do I want my kid to go to a school that's funded above normal levels, or do I want my kid to go to a school that's 
fund it below normal levels, but that's the decision where no one would, would in their right mind, at least if those were the options, make those decisions. Or uh, uh, do I want to make more profit by uh, uh, feeding a portion of my customers in the, in the back without having to give them any service? Or do I want to make less profit by feeding them up front and also open up jobs to, uh, uh, to them so that the waiters and waitresses would have, or the white waiters and waitresses would have less job? Or am I willing to go out of business for that? And so, in fact, if you look at, so this became the decision dilemma, do we end segregation uh, or do we go out of business? And that really became the choice. Before is, do we make money or do we make even more money? And now the decision is, do we end segregation, which we don't want to do, or do we go out of business, which we also don't want to do? If you look at the two Pulitzer Prize winning books on the Civil Rights Movement, Burying the Cross and Parting the Waters, uh, they both describe how in Montgomery, Alabama in particular, but in a number of other cities as well, when they had the public hearings uh, at City Hall or County Hall about, the, uh, about ending segregation there, the ones who came forth and demanded an end to legal segregation in those narrow contexts were wealthy uh, housewives whose maids say they can't come over after 6 o'clock and uh, help them set up their fancy dinner parties. Uh, uh, because they couldn't catch the bus home after, so they couldn't get their ride share after a certain time. So you have people who were really wealthy who could not put these, these parties together without their, their domestic help, uh, who are now saying, we demand an end of segregation because we want to have these fancy parties and we can't have it without help. Right? That was the main one. And in many of the cities, the main one, that was in Montgomery in particular, but in many of the cities, the main ones calling for an end of segregation were the small business owners who were about to lose their life savings in these businesses. And it wasn't because they suddenly, in spite of the uh, rhetoric that we've heard to the contrary, it wasn't because uh, direct action or civil disobedience somehow engaged the white community in this, in this uh, uh, reciprocal act of love. It was because they were going broke. And so it wasn't white people coming saying, I, really, I realize now that black people are human beings and law. It was like, you got to change this law because these people are making me go out of business. And I hate them, but if, if, I don't, if you don't do this, then I'm going to lose my business and I'm going to uh, uh, go to the poorhouse when I'm doing really good now. All right? So then this increased the cost of uh, maintaining the system. There was no way at this point, once this movement reached critical mass, there was no way that the system could have remained intact and profitable. It, it, at this point, it cost more money to maintain segregation than it did to end it. So if they were making boatloads of money through segregation, they were now losing both loads of money at the end of segregation. And so the only way then that we could convince the, large, uh, the majority of the population to end <coughs> segregation was to make it cost them money. And it's not that they were saying they wanted integration, it was a saying, saying we don't want to lose any more money. This was what ended segregation. It's the same thing, same idea uh, covering the housing market. So the, then the potential then for, the, for social movements uh, is to create that kind of scenario again. The potential for social movements is to create at least for portions of the society, if not, if the social movement were big enough, of course, for the entire society, but to make it so expensive to maintain existing ways of doing things that it would, uh, it would rather not do them. Uh, even if it enjoyed doing them, even if it liked doing it, even if it used to benefit from them, it costs so much to do it that they simply will stop doing it. And it doesn't mean that their, that their feelings have changed uh, towards the subjects or towards the, tar towards the target. It just means that they can no longer afford to do business that way. This is the power of a social movement. However, this can only happen if we have a couple, uh, at least two things in place. One is a desire to do this. That is a desire to, in one instance, walk every day uh, for a year in the cold, in the rain, etc., uh, in order to end uh, a, a particular type of system, or get ketchup poured on your head and soda poured on you uh, and get arrested uh, to sit and have a burger at a racist, dirty shop. Um, so that has to exist. But the second thing that has to exist are demands that you say you want. So if we have this series of actions that take place, but there's no demand around it, then even if you win, then what have you won? So they would have all these actions saying, we don't like segregation, uh, but then would not have put forth a, um, uh, a demand I think two things. One is, at some point, people would say, why are we doing this, the people who are doing it? But the second point uh, is that there would be no way to actually win. There'd be no end to it, because there'd be no natural win point. Uh, so I think that then, uh, then having a demand would be a critical, would be a, um, not just critical, but a prerequisite to advancing a social movement. 
and you cannot have a social movement, certainly not protracted over a long period of time, without having clear demands. And in addition, I think people would, uh, as I mentioned, would not want to uh, engage in that kind of uh, activity for a long period of time if they didn't see what's coming on the other side. All right, let's do real quick, we'll do what a social movement could look like, and then we will go to uh, open it up. So, what do we think a social movement could look like? So we think, of course, first of all, the social movements have to have, be clear on, uh, the most powerful ones are gonna be able to be clear on missions, objectives, strategies, and tactics. Inside of objectives can be demands. At a minimum, they're gonna have to have these, but we think it only gets better as you go up the ladder. So the social justice movement will be more powerful if it's clear on objectives, not just demands, and if it's clear on missions, then it could fundamentally uh, change society. Um, uh, yeah, just couldn't get any better than that. All right, so we have used as a metaphor for the movement then in uh, a sphere. Uh, when we did this though, we didn't have the budget to get a, someone to draw a sphere for us. Mm -hmm. So we had to take whatever came in PowerPoint as the arrow. So uh, this is a metaphor for the, for, uh, for the movement. Uh, so the tip of the spear here is then what we've just seen, which is what we call positive action. Uh, what many people call civil disobedience, we do have a distinction, that's another presentation, which I'm doing here, but just think of it as direct action or civil disobedience or positive action, but for a number of reasons, uh, we have again have a definition, we call it uh, a positive action. This is an intentional breaking of the law, but more uh, important than even breaking the law, it is a way of disrupting business as usual, of making business as usual non-profitable. Uh, this gets a lot of attention. It gets a lot of attention because it's, it's uh, uh, visually exciting. People chaining themselves to things and people uh, uh, be willing to take a rest, etc. Uh, but what it really does in the, in the function of a spear is that it opens up political space, just like a spear does when it go, you know, the tip of a spear does when it's attacking, is this is what creates the opening of the space. What really does the killing, though, in a spear is not the tiny point there, because that would be too small to kill something, kill most things. What really kills uh, are the two hooks at, uh, uh, on the sides. But the tip of the spear is the only way you can get in. So when we we're doing Take Back the Land, which of course was an organization where we engage in positive action, we would identify vacant government-owned and foreclosed homes. We would then break into them and move families in. And then when the police came, we'd launch eviction defenses to prevent the police from evicting them. Uh, we were engaged in what we call positive action campaigns. And then we had a couple of things that happened which then evolved the model and moved it to where it is now. So we had in, um, uh, and we're pretty confident about what we're doing here, but there's some things with the positive action, with the action that we want to take, and with the vision that we're laying out, but there were some practical things which we hadn't thought on the way out. So we did the positive action work uh, by moving families in, and then we, um, um, uh, and then we engaged in, uh, 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 when, we, when we stood to stand up against the police, <coughs> then it was time to engage in some kind of negotiations, which we hadn't really thought out. We hadn't really thought out the extent to which we could win, and we ended up winning way quicker than we expected, and therefore weren't able to plan out that well. So we had a couple of instances which then, we think, moved the model. So one happened in, where did this happen? Is this in Madison? I think it was here, when you had the, the, the mayor called. Uh, what are we doing? Take back land. Were you, were you there with that? Well, uh, so I think it was, it was here in Madison. So we had uh, uh, did an action here in Madison where we took over a house that was vacant, moved the family in, made a lot of local media. Uh, but then after that, uh, after the media went away, a few weeks later, the mayor's office called here. It called uh, I'll take the local take back oh, land. Oh, Turbot. Hmm? Yeah, that was on Yeah, sorry. The mayor's office called and said, uh, you know, we don't like what you did, we don't agree with what you did, however, you raised some very interesting points about there being vacant homes and there being people who were homeless, and um, also about the banks getting bailouts, you raised some really interesting points, so we want you to call, and, you know, come in and talk to us about what you think some of the policy changes should be. And so they, from here, uh, they called me and they said, you know, I was, I was helping put together the national network, and they said, you won't believe this, the mayor called and said, we have, uh, we're have coming to discuss policy, what should we say? And I said, I don't know, we haven't thought it out that far. So we, then the question became, what happens if you engage in positive action and you win, and the state calls and says, we're ready to negotiate, what do you do then? And that led us to the second part of the model, which is public policy. And we'd have to be able to come up with public policy prescriptions, uh, which would then change the way things happen on the ground, even if they didn't change the underlying values of it, uh, but we had that public policy prescription, which then would fix uh, some of the, the uh, more extreme uh, areas of the problem, but would also then grow the movement, we felt, by giving people a demand that they could get around 
even if it didn't have them all tied into the objectives, and our objectives were around the human right to housing and community control of the land. So we had then an incident in Miami, which actually preceded the one that happened in, in Madison. But in Miami, we did a, uh, uh, there was a family who was evicted from their home. They had nowhere to stay, so they spent a weekend living in a bread truck. Uh, they had nowhere to, to stay, so then the, they were evicted on a Friday. The following Monday, we broke into their house and moved them right back in, and we called over the media and we had them come out. Michael Moore uh, also came, was in the, this was actually featured in the movie, uh, Capitalism, A Love Story. Um, but so we moved them in, we called up the real estate agent, we said, we just moved, broke into the house, uh, why don't you come and get it? We're like taunting it to try to get them to come. And uh, so not too long afterwards, the police came, and we had to stand up with the police, and eventually the police huddled up and they left. And um, then we we did a you know eviction watch. We we're ready to take on the eviction offense all the time. So it was like two weeks, like out there every day, ready to take on another eviction offense. And then I got a call. I don't know how they got my cell phone number, but it was the bank. And the bank said, "Look, uh, we don't want to fight you about this. We will give you the house. Who do you want to who do you want us to make the deed out to?" And we we're like, "What?" <laughs> so we we're fully unprepared for that. So the question was then for us is if we engage in positive action campaigns and we win, and the bank says we can have the house, then what do we do? We were a protest movement. We were a bunch of people who wanted to take over homes. We did not want to become landlords, and we also didn't think uh, that the house should necessarily go to the individual homeowner. We thought that it should be collectively owned and controlled. But we weren't that far along yet. We ended up coming up with community land trust as the idea. But in terms of the model, it raised the question that if we win, then what do we do if we have the chance to take some form of power ourselves? And that was then the third way. These alter alternate structures, alternate ways of doing things that did not rely on the government's public policy, but what was our own public policy? What if we win and we're able to see some level of control or some level of power, then what do we do? And we need to have that part uh, ready and in place uh, as well. And the tension between these two areas, we think would eventually evolve into something else. We also need to have the coordination among the groups, so we need to have collaboration and facilitation happening uh, there. And then uh, support services that would provide support services to people who were engaged in positive action for and with, as well as here. So we had the, the full model made out for the movement. We think this model, as effective as it was in terms of conceptualizing what could work to take back the land, is still applicable for whatever social movement we can and should be building today. And that we should build a movement with multiple organizations that are engaged in the way in which they make, make sense for them. One of the interesting things that happened, particularly around the foreclosure crisis, is we have policy groups who knew what they wanted, had clear ideas of what policy changes should be made, what laws should be changed, but they had no ability to win any of those demands because they had no way of putting pressure on those who were in power. Uh, conversely, you had a group of people who were willing to engage in all kinds of outrageous actions and were then able to get the mayor to call them and say, what are your demands, but had no idea what the demands should be. Uh, and yet, we were not talking to each one another, which is a big indication that you're not in a movement, you are in a, an organization. So with, as a holistic movement then, we'd have to have all of these pieces in place, uh, and we need to do that. And I think the same th needs to be said about this moment in time. We need to figure out what the integral pieces are, what the third way is, which we have some ideas about what they could, what they could be, and then how do we collaborate, facilitate among all these different organizations, not just these, these different parts of the movement, and then organizations inside this. So there could be 10, 20 organizations here, 10 or 20 organizations there, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so but we need to have a level of collaboration and facilitation uh, in order for that to happen. So we think that we, we have, at this moment, the potential to build a robust social justice movement uh, that could significantly advance the ball in a number of areas, uh, certainly around the, uh, uh, the notion of state violence or the area of state violence. But we have to develop a holistic social justice movement that's firmly rooted inside of um, uh, of, of objectives and demands, uh, and a willingness of people to do what they have to do in order to achieve those demands. All right, so lastly, before we, we move on, the, so then uh, uh, the, the question is what do we do, what do we have to do in order to uh, actually have a social justice movement, which we think right now we do not have one. We, we have potential for one, but we haven't quite crossed that boundary yet. Uh, and we have an analysis, which I share a little bit of, the, one of the, the underlying analysis that we have is that the black community is actually a domestic colony inside of the United States. That there are colonies, of course, that we think about on the continent of Africa and, and in uh, South and Central America, but the black community is a domestic colony inside of the United States, and therefore that's still, that's still in the frame that we do here, uh, 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 colonized territory, uh, many colonized territories inside of the United States. That's what we have to break out of. So what do we need to have in place in order to build, so what does it take to build a social movement here? Um, so we can when you see it, you'll, you'll wonder why you didn't come with yourself. So this is our formula for coming up, for developing a social movement that we think we need to have now. 
Uh, there are a few pieces in here that are not fully developed and certainly too broad to use in a real mathematical sense, uh, but we think that the basic is right. Some of these would have to be broken down inside. Of it. So uh, again, we think the fundamental uh, argument is that we're inside of a, uh, a colonized territory. We're a domestic colony inside the United States. So inside the colonized territory then, and we want to emerge from just being a colonized territory, so there's three territories we can talk about. One is colonized, one is liberated, and the other is contested. And the contested is where we have a social movement, where the, it, it's still colonized, but we are contesting and, and actively attempting to liberate the territory. So to turn it into a contested territory, there, and there's a couple other parts that have to exist, but this would be about the territory itself. So inside the colonized territory, this would be inside of a city or a town or a, uh, or a county, not uh, uh, the whole country. There's a separate formula for the whole country. But inside of that, we'd have to have the issue at stake, and we think social movements are fundamentally built around issues. Uh, we have to get, in order to be um, uh, radical or revolutionary in terms of the scope, we'd have to go beyond just one issue and go into some bigger things. But it'd have to be a, uh, 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 there'd have to be an issue, and it have to be a prime issue or a derivative, but it couldn't be further than a third derivative. And again, we have a model around what this, uh, how many derivatives we have. But it have to be somewhere between a prime and a third uh, of, of, a, of a main uh, issue, which we think police brutality is, uh, certainly is a, uh, is a prime. Um, so inside of the prime, there would have to be, um, this is an issue which I, I didn't uh, raise in here, but there would have to be a sense of relative deprivation of material conditions. So. We, I, uh, I think some of the questions people have around social movements is why can't we just say, okay, if people reach this level of, uh, of abuse or this level of poverty, why don't people just rise up? Like as soon as you start making less than you know, uh, $500 a year or something like that, then that should that automatically trigger. And what we're arguing is, uh, and a lot of social scientists believe, is that it's not just, it's not an absolute number of poverty or an absolute amount of, of brutality. It is a relative amount. The relative, so it would be relative to the time in which you live in, so the amount of poverty or brutality that you face today would be different than the amount or that you could tolerate today would be different than the amount you could tolerate in two, three, five, five hundred years ago. Um, and it's also in relation to what else you see in society. So the level of tolerance for black people today uh, for abuse is far less than it was in the 50s and 60s because of our proximity to white communities and because of the way that we've seen uh, our own social advancement. So a relative de uh, deprivation in terms of material conditions as it relates to the core issue uh, would, have been, would have to be in place. So uh, as it relates to police, so if we see now, for example, a grandmother getting evicted from her home, that could have some impact, but it would not have an impact on the movement against police brutality. It could have an impact on the movement against foreclosures, but that moment has passed several years ago. So that would be relative deprivation of material conditions inside of the uh, issue area, and that would, uh, and therefore, uh, we have to have a certain level of consciousness and the uh, overall, what we call negative uh, action or negative attitudes in the broader society, not just the government, which creates the material conditions, but basically the white backlash would have to be uh, somewhat on the rise, at least. And we'd have to have consciousness around that. Not just that it's on the rise, we'd have some level of awareness around that. And that would have to happen over time. So it couldn't just happen in one moment. So it never happens with just one uh, action uh, if Mike Brown would have been killed, the exact same thing would happen, but Trayvon Martin would have happened before that, we don't think there would have been a rebellion there. That's to happen, something that happens over uh, a period of time. Uh, uh, so if you have all of those together, and then in addition to that, you would have a dialectical moment or the spark uh, or trigger uh, inside of the same uh, issue area, the prime issue area, then that would uh, create the, the uh, that together will be the form that you need to have in order to get to a contested zone. So we're working on this full out. This would actually have three pieces around the broader society, the specific area, the city or the town, and then the individual to determine. Right. So we have formulas which we're working on those. So, uh, so that's it, and uh, thank you so much, and we'll take questions and comments and all that. And I need you to speak up without trouble hearing the groups. Sure. This is just a question of clarification, but uh, are you saying that in order for this model to succeed, that there must be some sort of precipitating moment? Yes. I, I ask this because of your comment about the uh, foreclosure moment being over. Yes. 
So yes, we do think that's true. We mentioned that in two respects. One is when we talked about the absolute prerequisites for a uh, social movement, is that there had to be a trigger um, uh, or, 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 or a moment, or uh, in a more scientific sense, we call it a dialectical moment. So we'd have to have that. However, uh, if there are other things going on around it, we can create that moment. Rosa Parks certainly did that with an intentional decision to sit down, uh, to refuse to get up uh, uh, from her seat. Um, uh, so if we had those, the right combination of those things together, we can actually create the trigger. Uh, we can create the dialectical moment. Uh, it's extremely difficult, and you never know when at the end. It doesn't work consistently. Uh, but we do think we can create the dialectical moment. That, we don't, that that doesn't have to happen as an outside force, even though the reality is happening as an outside force all the time. So as it relates to police brutality, not only do we not want it to, to create the dialectical moment, we don't have to do that. So, uh, linked to the same uh, issue, is it possible to create a social movement with a non-social trigger? I mean, um, in a more peaceful way, let's say, that? Well, so the trigger doesn't have to be violent, so it can be peaceful. So, Rosa Parks, uh, uh, sitting down on the bus, I'm not saying it, it wasn't violent, it, uh, uh, that it was totally peaceful, it was not, but it wasn't her not being peaceful, it was the police not being peaceful. Um, so yes, it, uh, that can happen. Uh, but for us, that's not the major point. What we're trying to end is the, uh, is the broader injustice, um, and, um, and we're not in control, for a large part, of the social triggers. Uh, but uh, the other thing is, is, because of the nature of uh, uh, human emotions and the nature of oppression uh, and the nature of the definition of what dialectical moments mean, it would have to be an extreme act. So um, uh, I don't think that, it, that a trigger would be uh, someone getting arrested um, uh, and having their arm slightly turned and having a very small bruise on it and getting you know, released within four hours even though they never should have been stopped. People might, might think, okay, you shouldn't have been stopped, and it, but that is not gonna trigger a movement. Mm -hmm. Only the most extreme situations are gonna trigger a movement. Uh, and that's why it has to be called a trigger or a movement moment or a dialectical moment. I mean, given that the Democratic Party can put in place this, to use your analogy with the colonized country, put in place a neo-colonial class of, you know, a black middle class, uh, and given the, um, up to, up, up till now at least, the apparent uh, complete subservience of the black community, you know, to the, um, to the Democratic Party, um, how do you see the Black Lives Matter movement or, or what, however you want to describe, I mean, this nascent black power movement, you know, is obviously a threat to, this, to, to their rule. Um, how do you see avoiding, on the one hand, the, the, the repression, because the repression, you know, is, you know better than I do. Um, and also, but, but I think the bigger threat is, is co-optation. I mean, uh, you know, there, there must be just strenuous attempts, and even if you look at Madison, Wisconsin, you see major attempts to try and buy off sections of the movement. So how do you see steering between the Scylla and Charybdis of the, of yep. the two and not getting in, entangled in the, the spider web of the, of, the, of the corporate political system? Yep, so I think the way to, um, uh, to avoid uh, the, uh, the violent backlash of the system is to not engage in meaningful actions. So if you do things that are not going to result in any meaningful challenge to the system, then you're gonna avoid any, any significant attacks. Uh, but it also means that you're not gonna change any of the underlying conditions. So that's really the trade-off you have to make. <clears throat> and that's not because we want to engage in, uh, in violence, it's just that that's the way that the system has shown, that even if you provide some marginal, I mean, the, I remember uh, when, the, uh, when the war against Iraq, the first war against Iraq started, 
Uh, there were a bunch of anti-war groups which popped up here and there, and it turned out that the feds were spying on, it was like grandmas for peace or something like that, and they were bringing like brownies and things. And they sent like federal agents to the brown, they were spying on their emails. So this is not like, you know, us doing that. This is a, a government that feels threatened by uh, grandmothers who were, and there was no indication at all they were like planning some, uh, that the grandmother thing was just some cover for something else, uh, which happens, it did not happen in, in, in this case. Um, so yeah, so I think that the only way to avoid that is to uh, is to avoid doing anything that has any uh, real significant that's going to result in any real significant changes in the, in the posture. I wasn't suggesting. Yeah, 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 no, no. I think that's so I think. That, so in terms of of uh, a co-optation, I think the uh, there's only two ways to do that. One is to have ideological clarity, so that it's clear what co-optation is and what it's not. And I think there are there's co-optation that happens when people are co-opted willingly and eagerly, and they want to be co-opted and they want to be bought off. Uh, and I think that does happen. There are other times when it happens where uh, they're just not ideologically clear, and they actually think that they're advancing things, uh, even though they're not. Uh, so they think that their uh, co-optation is a victory, uh, even though it's clearly not. It's a victory for those who are more ideologically clear about the issue. So I think what, the first part is ideological clarity, so you know what co-optation is and what it's not. Uh, but then the second is there has to be uh, direct connections to uh, people in, uh, who are most impacted in grassroots com communities so that they can hold those who are in a position to do some negotiating um, uh, or who, who can present uh, and who do present in front of the media or in front of those who are in power uh, can hold them accountable and hold them directly accountable and punish them uh, for selling them out because in the end uh, those people are really punishing those who are most impacted. We're not quite like right now at the point of, of, of a social movement, but we have a number of these pieces. And so, what are you, what's yeah? What are your thoughts on like what else we need to kind of to to move this from the yeah into it into a social? I think we're missing two things that are related, mm -hmm. uh, but the ideological clarity. There's no underlying analysis of what the what the problem is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's some people who say we love the police and right. we just want them to stop beating us up, and other people are saying yeah. the police are. Inherently, uh, because of the, the, the history in this country and the, and the fact that black people are domestic colony in this country, uh, are inherently problematic and we need to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. uh, those are not two positions that can be reconciled, and to have them both in the same organization or the same camp doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think then the, the next line down to that, which is related, is demands. Right now, there are no viable demands. The biggest demand that has emerged thus far is. is uh, encouraging, asking, begging the state to spy on us more than they do now by having body cameras. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that if, that if they would have proposed themselves, we'd be in the street protesting. The same people were protesting against having uh, body cam, uh, having, uh, uh, rather, uh, uh, traffic cameras affixed to poles uh, and had real problems with that happening because of our impacts on our privacy. Uh, seemed to have less problems with, you know, instead of having it fixed to a pole and pointing at your car, having it pivot and get on legs and run down the street and chase you. So I think that the, the, we were at a meeting just with the, uh, in New York when this was just starting to happen, uh, when the, some of the discussion around body cameras started to happen. And uh, we're walking into the meeting and just quickly recognized that there were cops outside of the meeting hall we're going in. Yeah, it was a public street, I'm sure they weren't there for us. I don't know, maybe they were, but, I don't know. but one on one side, one on the other. And it occurred uh, to me that they could each have body cameras. They could just sit there like on a beach chair, and they could just sit there all day reading the paper, eating donuts, whatever, and they could literally film everyone all day long who's walking in and out of that place. So lay on, that's, that's terrible. So lay on top of that two things. One is their ability to, to keep information forever. Like we know already they're taking phone calls and they're, they're recording phone calls and keeping them forever, right? Uh, so they're gonna be able to do that with the, uh, with that. But then layer on top, so that, that, that is a huge, huge problem. They're going to know forever every building you've ever walked in. Uh, this is a, a major, major uh, issue. But then layer on top of that, have you ever seen the, the, the police cars? I'm sure they have them here also. Uh, but the, uh, on the back of some police cars, they have like two black, look like little wings, tiny wings that are out like that. Those are real time um, license plate readers. So while the cop is driving, you know, it could be texting or whatever, those license plate readers are reading license plates of cars that are coming in and going. Mm -hmm. uh, and, are able, and then when, when they hit one, like, uh, license suspended or you know, tag expired, they get a pop-up inside the car and then they can turn around and go get it. They don't have to see it, they can be driving 80 right. miles an hour, mm -hmm. uh, whatever they get that. <clears throat> Facebook now is 
you know, has been testing for some time, is using, and uh, I'm sure you've seen it, you've seen you, you put a picture up and it says, is this your friend, so and so, for so anyone, and putting facial recognition yeah. software for some time. When they sell that facial recognition software to the police, the police are just gonna be able to just layer that on top of it, they're gonna be walking, they can sit in the donut shop, eat a donut, and have a thing in their ear, and it'll say, did, 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 someone just walked by you right now in a blue shirt, and it's this person, and we have a warrant out for them. Go get them. And they can just sit there and have that. Uh, so this is uh, uh, this is a potential nightmare, and right now we are begging them to do that as a movement. Um, so I think that, that's bad. But aside from that, I don't think that's enough to build a movement around. I can't build a movement around asking the government to spy on you, even if, even if not being that uh, cynical, can't, uh, about that low level of a demand. You know what I mean? The demand is just too low level for that. Uh, so we do not have clear demands, and you can't build a movement around demands. And yet what's so interesting, I think, about this moment, this was the same problem that plagued Occupy, by the way, is that for many, many years, I know organizing, the biggest problem we had is that we had a pretty clear idea of what we wanted, but like getting people to come to a march or to a rally or to something was like really, really hard. Like it was really tough to get 15, 20 people to come out. Uh, to come, even though we had a very clear idea of what we wanted to win and why it was in people's best interest, et cetera. So we had a uh, clear idea of what we wanted, but an inability to get people to come out forever. Now we have the exact opposite problem. We have hundreds of thousands of people taking the streets. We have people blocking traffic, we have people confronting police, we have people blocking Christmas, <coughs> which is amazing, I never thought I would see that. Almost got people killed in Miami uh, doing that. Uh, so we have amazing, people doing amazing, incredible work with no demands. <coughs> so we have the exact opposite of the one that we had before. We had demands, but no one was willing to fight for them, and now we have people willing to fight, but not clear demands. So again, if we were to, shut down all the streets of Madison, Wisconsin. I mean, this is a little different here because the Freedom Inc. and, and YGB clearly has uh, uh, clear demands, although we need to, to make them a little more um, pragmatic and work workable. Not pragmatic as a demand, but be it clear, more clear to articulate how they work on the ground. Uh, but in most cities, you have know, people shutting down traffic and doing this, that, and the other thing. Uh, and if the government were to come out and say, okay, you win, we're giving to all of your demands. And what's going to happen if, if, no matter what, the leaders go in and negotiate, a, a significant portion of the people who are protesting are going to be unhappy because no one knew what they were fighting for when they got there. They're just fighting general. They're just expressing general outrage, which is extremely important. But expressing general outrage is not sufficient to make up a social movement. We don't have that yet. But I, th I think there's, I mean, I think in different places there are some specific demands. I mean, for example, um, you know, we want this specific officer fired or whatever. Um, and so I, so are, you're talking about, and, and, and I also agree with you, but you're talking about kind of a large, a, a movement that is under, like, demands that are all the same, right? Like, we're talking about, like, a unified. Not yeah. just unified demand, but, like, we can't build a, a movement to fire not I agree. I totally agree. Oh, right. So, so yeah. yeah, so it would be yeah. what, what laws or what policies are we getting, even if, sure. in the back, even if they're backwards. Like, for example, um, uh, uh, Campaign Zero, I think, recognizes. this which is the offshoot of, of Occupy, of, 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 of Black Lives Matter. And they and they, develop, have, the ones have, they have issues yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't agree with the demands. I think they are yeah. way too soft yeah. uh, and don't go to the heart of things. But they have a clearly well thought out, internally, inter, they have its own internal logic set of demands. And that's extremely important. You can actually build a movement off of that. It would, I don't think it would, be, it would reach its potential for this moment. But you, you can actually build a movement off of those types of demands. Even though I don't support those demands myself, uh, there's a good chunk of them which I'm opposed to. Some of them I'm not. Uh, but I don't think that they're nearly ambitious enough for this time in history. Uh, but we need to have clearly articulated demands. And I think we need to go further than that and have clearly articulated objectives and an analysis, shared analysis. And that's the only way we're going to make substantial changes. Yes? I was just curious about um, if you had applied your model or if you had thought about how we would increase the, the cost in terms of mass incarceration. It seems to me like the cost already is prohibitive. You know, the cost of feeding, the cost, the opportunity cost of increasing, you know, making better criminals by putting, you know, especially young ones in jail and have them having no opportunity. And then also what happens to them when they come out where they have no choice but to offend again and go back in. So it seems to me like the cost is already high. It's already high for governments, it's already high for communities. Um, the families who who fail, who um, you know, whose loved ones are in prison, they may have been half the bread winner or whatever, those families you know, have extra costs or whatever that they have to deal with, including when they come back out. So it's like, it seems to me like it's a, it's a compounding problem. Right. 
and the cost is already too high. So right. how but, would you... But let's remember, we're thinking about a relationship. The cost has to be in relationship to those who are doing the oppressing and the exploiting. The cost is far too great for the family, and it's far too great for our communities. But our families and our communities are not the ones exploiting the people who are going in prison and spending all the prison stints in there. So and as far as the, the private prison industry, for example, the private prison industry is one of the major donors for uh, presidential candidates on both the Democratic and Republican side. Uh, up at this point, Hillary Clinton really just said she would no longer take uh, money from uh, bundlers in the prison industry. But she, up at this point, that has been, like, I think her second biggest campaign contributor uh, has been those. And so they're the ones who the cost have to be. But it's not too great for them. They're getting government money. And in some cases, like with the, um, uh, in the cases of, uh, of, of, of immigrant detention centers, they're getting guaranteed money whether there are people in there or not. So they have to have a certain number, but, um, but they are, the government, in order to not get ripped off, is, is putting more people in those beds just so they make sure they get their money's worth. I can see that private industry already failing. The market won't support that because uh, governments are already figuring out that they have to agree make these agreements and keep a certain number of people. They're not able to meet that. They're not able to, the supply chain's falling apart. So I can see that part of it failing, but it's the non-privatization like, isn't it our communities that are the ones that are, by our policing structures, by the laws that we choose to enforce, you know, building the prisons, and they're not privatized. You know, in that case, I don't understand, like, how do you disrupt that cost? Because it's the community that is upholding that structure, not the But the community is not, the black community has no say in what the police does in the black community. We are not upholding that structure. We don't have a say in what the police does. There's no black people who are saying we want police in robo gear coming in, knocking down our doors at two o'clock in the morning and pulling over our children and stuff like that. So I answer my question about how, what, how do you disrupt the cost? Like the the, the prisons are so if you think about the prisons and not just the policing are isolated. So do we, or how do we do we stop the food goes to the prison? Like what's the sit in? The, the, the bus boycott, the whatever, for yep. mass incarceration. Yes, so I think we need to figure that one out. I don't have a, a, a great sense of that one, uh, but I think that is one of the uh, one of the questions that we have to tackle. Um, uh, but I do think, over, in general, overwhelming the system, even the prison system, with a larger number of, in the, uh, in the police system, with a larger number of people than they can handle, is one of the ways of significantly increasing the cost in a way they can't handle. Um, uh, I think we need to figure out how we can increase the cost on uh, Prisons on the private prisons, uh, which I don't think we as a movement has gotten to ground on. I don't certainly don't have a, uh, a good sense of that. But we have to somehow come up with creative ideas which we can figure those things out. Yes. Um, <clears throat> well, in both private and public prisons, uh, prison labor is a huge factor. And like since the end of the Civil War, Angela Davis wrote about this in uh, Women Raising Class, but they started incarcerating black males and women. Um, uh, these crazy high rates because slave labor was no longer an option. And so like, I think that is the profit point where we can be targeting prisons. And here in Wisconsin, um, the, you know, the university system has a contract with prisons. It's called uh, like Badger State Industries. And so if prison labor can produce certain things more cheaply than other you know, organizations in the market, uh, which is almost always the case because they pay pennies on the dollar, um, then we have to contract with prisons. So that means that like the beds in the dormitories, the desks in these classrooms, um, a lot of the stuff on this campus has been made by prison labor where they pay like, I mean, outrageously low wages. Um, and then they overcharge people for commissary. There was a recent victory with um, uh, phone calls that are much, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so you can actually like talk to your family, which mm -hmm. gets at the recidivism rates that you were talking about. Um, so something that I think that we could do as people on this campus that would dramatically impact the incarceration rates here would be to divest and disconnect that economic relationship in our education system and the prison system. Mm -hmm. right. I think a couple of other schools in the Big Ten have already done that. The students have pushed for it. I think it ended up taking off that um, uh, mission. But I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's helpful. Um, and then I actually had a different comment that I want or a question both. Um, so I studied folklore, and one piece of this map that I, I would like to hear a bit more about, or that I, I don't know if I'm supposed to say that was missing, is the, um, the sense of values and narrative that comes along with social movements, because it, it, it isn't just a tag-along factor, it's part of the driving force. 
you talked about Rosa, uh, Rosa Parks, for example. And everyone thinks of this um, elderly black woman who was tired and sat down, and that's why she was arrested. Um, most people don't know about Claudette Colvin, who was a 15-year-old pregnant girl who sat down and was arrested. And then Rosa Parks was an advisor to one of the organizations that she was in, um, and they, they planned that action. It was a specific civil disobedience moment, but um, the community controlled that narrative, and that's the story that they told, and that's the story that's remembered internationally now. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've seen a bit of that, um, but with communication changing, I don't know. I wonder, um, is that a piece of, you know, like the, that sphere diagram? Um, where does that come in in terms of like um, telling our stories? Yep. So, first of all, thank you so much for uh, raising the point about prison labor, uh, and that is a way in which we could increase the, the certainly decrease the, the, the profit that is associated with prisons, uh, is by removing, if we outlawed prison labor, it would certainly stop a bunch of money that's going in now uh, from corporations that are paying politicians to increase uh, uh, prison sentences because they know they get more money, they make more money that way, they get a bigger pool of, of workers that way. Uh, so I think that's a really important point, I thank you for that. Um, uh, so, uh, in terms of the values of the, of the civil of the uh, of social movements, so try to uh, kind of uh, separate the two out, both in the, in the presentation here, uh, in the function of the social movement and the values of them, or the or at least what the stated values are. Uh, and we mentioned a little bit in the civil rights movement, there was a lot of talk about the redemptive value of love, and there is even uh, now almost every time you hear the word non uh, uh, civil disobedience, you hear in front of it nonviolent civil disobedience. And nonviolent civil disobedience, of course, is a singular phrase that means a philosophy around civil disobedience. And even people who say nonviolent civil disobedience don't adhere to the philosophy, but I think that is something, certainly something that King uh, adhered to. Uh, but I don't think that what, and even though that was something that they talked about, and something that maybe uh, made them feel good and better, I don't think the part of the civil rights movement that worked was the love aspect of it. That was not, I don't think that was a deciding factor in uh, winning any of the campaigns that they had. I, mean, I could be wrong, they could have, they would have come out and, and not said that, maybe then they would have never gotten support, maybe King was able to get brought of it. But I don't think, I think what worked was the economic damage, not the ability to turn. Um, so I, I don't think I have a full uh, 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 grasp about the, the, the values that win versus the values that lose in the same way as the mechanical part that wins and that, and that loses. With that said, there are cultural expressions that are extremely important to holding things together. Uh, it seems pretty clear you couldn't have had the Haitian Revolution without uh, the voodoo religion. Uh, and it looks like, uh, uh, even though, uh, well, everyone says anyhow that we couldn't have had the civil rights movement without the, the central role of the, uh, of the black church. Um, even though, mechanically, that's not the reason why it worked. It certainly looked like that was a substantial uh, force in making people believe that they were engaged in righteous behavior and therefore willing to, uh, to put up with abuses they probably would not have been able to do without some, uh, that what they felt like was some greater force guiding them. Um, uh, and I do think that we need to have broader values guiding our movement than just winning, even if it comes to sacrifice to someone else. Uh, and certainly the case of uh, uh, Claudette Colvin is, is a primary example of that, not only did the community not jump up behind her, but the NAACP refused her case, mm -hmm. uh, even though it was just a, a few short weeks before Rosa Parks and in the exact same city. Um, so I don't think that that speaks very highly of the movement. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, the reality is with Take Back the Land, we felt in very, very similar um, uh, ethical <coughs> decisions uh, where, um, uh, because uh, some people uh, were more media friendly, photogenic, well spoken, uh, then they got better attention than those who weren't. And there are people who feel like they are deserving of housing in a way that people who um, are not uh, uh, might be. So, which that's something that, that we believe, but we also were fully uh, cognizant of the fact that some people played better in the media and were therefore more likely to win than others did. So, then what is our responsibility there? What is our obligation there? So we had some, we had constant levels of confusion around that. Um, uh, I think we held pretty firm in our belief that housing is human right, but we did have struggles with the way to prioritize certain campaigns over others. Maybe one more question. Yes. Um, you started out, I appreciate this, talking about the 
discussion. I think things are really clear. I don't have a little trouble hearing you a little louder. I appreciate this discussion. I think things are really clear. Uh, you started out talking about the different scopes of transformation, and um, in the radical and revolutionary section, you pointed out the need for shifting values. And one part that's getting me a little bit tripped up, although I definitely agree that we need to, um, our targets are within the system need to feel the pain of the, uh, you know, the cost benefit analysis. But that also feels like it's not shifting values. So I was wondering if you could speak to where that value shift. Yeah, and I think that's why there's the distinction there, is that you can have a shift in laws without having a shift in values. Uh, and you can have the reverse, you can have a shift in values without having a shift in laws, but then the values would either be, the laws would either be applied differently, uh, or they would sh uh, change eventually. Uh, like I think uh, uh, it is a very legitimate perspective to say that given all the shootings that we have of uh, uh, black people in the United States by police, we actually don't need any changes in laws because they're not shooting white people at the same uh, rate, and they're not killing white people at the same rate, or arresting white people at the same rate. So you can certainly argue that we don't need to have the changes in laws, uh, that all we, we really need is a change in values so that black life is valued in the same way that white lives are. Uh, it is also a much bigger order uh, to, uh, to change values than it is to change laws. Uh, changing values, there are some markers, I guess, where you get some general areas, general areas of where you are, uh, I think the, the big problem, though, is that you don't know, uh, there's no objective way to measure if you've won or lost. Uh, so what we talk about is the, um, uh, is the black community as a uh, domestic colony. And we'll spend time talking about this tomorrow night in the presentation on, on, um, uh, on black community control of police. Uh, that we think that the fundamental problem, the fundamental analysis, is that the black community is a domestic colony. And that's what we should see as a fundamental problem that we have to look at and solve. I think right now the social justice movement as a whole, to whatever extent it exists, sees the fundamental problem as racism or discrimination. And that we have uh, racist police. You know. So if the fundamental problem is racism or discrimination, then that means the thing that we have to solve is racism or discrimination. That means we do have to convince hundreds of thousands of white people, if not millions, to voluntarily sit on a psychiatrist's couch for hundreds of hours in order to uh, uh, work themselves through the internal racial issues that they're uh, experiencing whatever they see or deal with or think about black people. Uh, I, first of all, it's not a campaign I'm particularly interested in. But even if we were interested in it, somehow we're able to do that, how would we measure whether or not we won that campaign? How would we measure if we were victorious there or if we lost? And over what period of time would we do that? While on the other hand, if we're talking about changing uh, colonial structures, uh, we could pretty easily measure if we have control over the police and if we have control over the area, the territories that we, that we uh, that we occupy at this time. So I think the, the other factor there, uh, you know, aside from revolutionary change, which means that you have, that you have complete control over the entire uh, territory, is that the, um, uh, the reforms in sectors is measurable. And it's easier than to say that this person sold us out or this person did not sell us out because they stuck to the plan. It's not exactly clear how we would measure some of those other things. So I think that was makes the changes in values very tricky and very difficult for, for social movements to to advance.